So I'm going to be talking about uh, threads and particularly shared variables in C++ OX. Uh, let me start out with sort of my usual disclaimer slide here. First of all, I'm going to be talking about something uh, that's in fact the work of many people. A lot of people contributed both to the C++ OX memory model and to well, the Threads API actually is, most, that I'm, is mostly the work of others. Um, C++ OX, of course, as you all know, is a misnomer. I, I think the hope is now that it'll be published in 2011. It's close, finally. Uh, I'll start with a quick overview and then say a little bit about the Threads API, though that just uh, hopefully as a reminder, this is, that's not really the focus of this talk. And then I'll talk about the, the memory model uh, a few uh, specific consequences of that and discuss, some, uh, discuss the support for atomic operations in C++ OX. What are threads? Hopefully we all know this already. So when I talk about threads, I'm talking about multiple instruction streams. You can think of them as programs that uh, operate on a shared memory. So the uh, assumption here is that static variables and everything they point to uh, is shared between all of the threads, can be accessed by all of the threads, whereas each thread has its own set of local variables and uh, as well as a set of thread local variables associated with it. Uh, this is actually slightly different in C++ OX and in the C1X specification, unfortunately. Uh, so in C++ OX, we assume that if you uh, put a pointer to, a, to somebody's stack location in a static variable, everybody can read that stack, even though it's the stack that belongs to another thread. C1X decided to allow implementations to make stacks uh, to make stacks private to a particular thread, uh, which I personally think is a mistake. They wanted to do this for backwards compatibility with some embedded, uh, uh, with some embedded app, uh, implementations. Uh, they have their own reasons for doing that, but I'll certainly assume that you can access other thread stacks, whereas I think you really need to. Uh, why are we talking about threads here? Well, traditionally, threads have been around for a long time as a way to process multiple event streams, essentially, or to run a background task while you keep a, an application responsive. That originally had a lot more to do with programming convenience uh, rather than performance, per se. On the other hand, since it was around already, it seems to also be the dominant way to take advantage of multi-core processes these days. And since we all know that uh, processes aren't really getting any faster in terms of clock rate or instructions per, they can execute per second or at least only slight, getting slightly faster, most of the performance improvement that we're seeing these days is as a result of take, uh, as a result of increasing the core count. So threads provide a good way to leverage that, not the only way to leverage that, but a reasonable way to leverage that to actually make your applications go faster on multi-core processes. Uh, I'll start way at the beginning here in terms of what threads mean, just to make sure we sort of all are looking at this roughly in the same way. I'm sure you all know this. But uh, a very simple view of how threads work is that essentially each of them have their own stream of instructions and these instructions, the instructions from all the threads are logically interleaved. Uh, so if I have one thread that uh, sets x to 1 and z to 3 and another thread that sets y to 2, this might be executed as uh, performing the first instruction from thread 1 then performing the instruction from thread 2, then performing the, the last instruction from thread 1. So just interleaving the execution of the different threads. And that's going to be our starting position here. This is also what's often termed sequential consistency. Uh, so any, any execution that you can understand this way is a sequentially consistent execution. And that'll be our starting point. That's not actually quite how C++ OX behaves, but for now that'll be good enough. Um, so threads in C++ OX, what's actually there in the standard? Well, threads are finally part of the language, uh, which is important because, as it turns out, you can't really describe threads purely as an add-on library because the presence of threads has some impact as to how the compiler has to behave, particularly with respect to com dealing with shared variable accesses and the like. And doing that in a library after the fact causes all sorts of problems. Uh, 
C++ OX has a threads API. It doesn't just support shared variables and threads fundamentally. It actually has an API for creating, uh, for creating threads and for synchronization, for making sure they don't get in each other's way and so on. Uh, my understanding here, and there are others in the room who understand the history here much better, is that most of the API actually is an evolution of Boostart Thread. So a lot of this, I think, will be familiar to many people in the room. Um, there was a lot of work invested in the, the C++ OX memory model, which is basically addressing precisely this question of what shared variables mean in the presence of threads. Uh, as I already suggested, it's close to the sequential consistency model that we talked about so far. It's close to just this interleaving based model, but it's not quite that. Uh, so the, the real question here is asking things like when does uh, some particular thread see an update to a variable that's performed by another thread? Uh, when is it okay to simultaneously access shared variables from multiple threads? Uh, and what's the, what's the effect of that? What are the allowable results of that? Uh, in order to basically make this memory model palatable, uh, it turns out we also need to support atomic operations. There are other motivations for that as well. We need to support atomic operations in the standard uh, wh whose definition is very closely tied to the memory model here. So I'll talk about these atomic operations as well. There are various other things in the language that I actually won't talk about because just for lack of time. So I won't talk about thread local variables except to mention that they exist. Um, there are some other places where the language actually takes advantage of the presence of threads and concurrency. Uh, so, and or in other ways, this affects the specification of the language. So, uh, static constructors are now under the right conditions allowed to execute in parallel rather than just in some in some uh, undefined order. Uh, Function local statics have somewhat different semantics than they used to in that the implementation is actually responsible for ensuring that these be initialized in a thread safe manner. So that if you call the function for multiple threads, the implementation has to make sure that exactly one of them initializes the, the function local static. So let me start by talking a little bit about the C++ OX Threads API. I'm not sure how familiar everybody is in the how familiar everybody in the room is with us. Um, I'll, this is by necessity an incomplete discussion here. So I'll start by presenting sort of an incomplete synopsis of the uh, uh, the actual thread class that's in the language. Uh, the important, the, probably the most important thing it provides is a constructor which both constructs the thread object and under the cover starts the thread running. Uh, basically, you give this, uh, you give the constructor some function object which it invokes with some supplied collection of arguments. For the examples we have, there, are, there won't be any arguments. Uh, there are a couple of other, there are then several things you can do with such a thread object. Once you've constructed it, the child thread automatically gets started. Gets started. Uh, you can wait for the child thread that you've just created to complete by calling join. And I'll discuss this later. I claim that that's actually pretty much always what you should do eventually. Uh, you can call detach on it which lets the child run on its own with uh, losing the ability to wait for it, which I will I'll point out later is probably not such a good idea. Uh, you can ask whether the thread is still joinable, whether, you, uh, whether it hasn't been waited for and with, with join and whether it hasn't been detached. So once it's been joined or detached, it's no longer joinable. Uh, and there are thread IDs associated with, uh, with threads, as you would expect. Uh, if you're familiar with any other threads, thread creation API, this is basically very similar. Uh, it's, very, it's similar in spirit to something like the, the, the POSIX API or so otherwise. Um, 
So here's a really simple example of how you use the API to create threads. I'm going to use a, a sort of really bad but very common example, which is a Fibonacci, a parallel Fibonacci application, which you should never write for all sorts of reasons. So in particular, it's the only example program that I know that's actually a double exponential worse than the, the real algorithm that you should be using. Uh, uh, but nonetheless, um, so was there a question? No. Um, so if, uh, if Fibonacci does sort of what you expect for small values, it just returns n. Uh, uh, for larger values, I'm, it needs to do two subcomputations in this naive algorithm. It needs to compute Fibonacci of n minus 1 and Fibonacci of n minus 2. I'm going to compute Fibonacci of n minus 1 in parallel here. I'm going to do that by creating a thread, to, uh, by running a thread to compute it separately. Uh, this thread is going to get past a function object which I will, which I'll call in the child thread. The function object is, in order to write down the function object, I'm going to use a lambda expression. A C++ OX lambda expression. Uh, the syntax here, I don't know, I suspect most people are familiar with it, I'm not sure. The syntax here is I have square brackets which includes a capture list which describes how free variables are going to be captured as part of this function. So this is telling me that unless I say otherwise by default, capture free variables, in particular n here by value, so this function object will have a copy of n in it, and capture the variable fib1 by reference. So if I, refer to the if I refer to the variable fib1 in the body of the function here, I'm referring to that through a reference. So in the body of the function here, I'm going to compute fib of n minus 1, and I'm going to assign the result to the variable fib1, which is the result variable here. Notice that I'm actually taking advantage of the fact that in C++ OX, I can access another thread stack from my thread. Since fib1 is actually a variable here in the parent thread, right, which was captured in this, uh, in this lambda expression, uh, so I'm assigning in the child thread to the parent thread fib1 variable, and that's okay in C++ OX. Supposedly not OK in C1X, though I suspect a lot of, a lot of applications will break if you disallow this. Um, then in the, uh, in the parent thread, I'm going to compute fib of n minus 2. I'm going to wait for the child thread, and I'm going to return the, the sum of these. At this point, since I've waited for the child thread, I know that fib 1 has been set to fib of n minus 1. Does that make sense? Um, so that's the initial example. I'll use that example also to point out another problem and actually to point out the divergence from boost threads, which is worth keeping in mind. Um, so it actually turns out that there's a, there's a subtle problem with this code uh, depending, on what the, uh, depending on what the destructor for this thread object actually does. So now this particular FIP function is simple enough that we're reasonably sure it's not going to throw exceptions. On the other hand, if we assume that we had a more complicated function here, and this, the parent call fib, to fib of n minus 2 actually threw an exception, then the question is what happens? The, the behavior here differs between boost threads and, and C++ OX threads. In boost threads, what happens is the thread variable gets destroyed as part of the destruction of the thread variable. The thread actually, the child thread is detached but keeps on running but I can no longer wait for it. That has the rather unfortunate consequence that if I leave the scope as a result of an ex exception here, I now have this child thread running which is going to assign to the parent's thread fib1 variable after this has returned, which is a really nasty bug. Uh, so, so as a result of this sort of possibility, the, the, the C++ OX standard actually doesn't follow boost here. And if you destroy a thread without having explicitly joined or detached it, what happens is you call terminate. That's an error. There's nothing, we talked about this for a long time, there's actually nothing reasonable you can do in that situation, I claim. <laughs>
Yeah? Wouldn't canceling a thread be a more natural way? Uh, so the question was whether canceling a thread would be a more natural way and uh, the answer there is potentially yes, however there is no way to cancel a thread in C++ OX. And uh, the, the reason for that is, uh, is long and complicated, which I'm not sure I want to go into here. It's, it, it has to do a lot sort of with political differences between standards committees rather than with, uh, I mean, it, my personal opinion is that there's no good technical reason for that, but other people disagree. Um, so C++ OX also gives what's probably a much better and safer way to write something like Fibonacci. This doesn't always, this is a higher level facility that is not always appropriate for what you want to do, but in this particular case I believe it works really well. Uh, so instead of explicitly creating a thread, uh, there's a facility in the language and this relies on a bunch of other things that I'm not going into in a lot of detail here, so this is just giving you the general flavor. Uh, there's a templated function async which you, to which you can give a function object which by default sort of at the implementation's discretion will either run this function, uh, will either run this function in the parent thread directly or if you don't have a lot of threads running at the moment, we'll start a child thread asynchronously to compute the value of fib of n minus 1 and give you back a future object which you can then retrieve the value from. So when async returns here, assuming this actually does create a child thread, what happens is I now have a child thread running that's busy computing fib of n minus 1. When it gets done, it will set the associated future here. Uh, so fib1 is now no longer just an integer, it's this more complicated future object here. It will, when it completes, basically make this future ready so that I can retrieve the value from it. Uh, so, so basically I can, with this thread running, go ahead and again compute fib of n minus 2 in parallel with the child thread running. Then at the end, rather than explicitly joining this thread, I just call get on, f on the future fib1, that waits for the thread to complete and then gives me back the value it returned or if it threw it an exception, it throws the exception at that point. Uh, and I can add the fib2 value, the value I computed locally to it and return the result. Uh, this doesn't solve all the world's problems clearly. I mean, if I were instead trying to sort an array, uh, this would be, I couldn't really get, I get away from accessing the parent stack and the child and things like that. So this doesn't quite solve all the problems on the past slide, but in this particular case it's much better. Okay, so in addition to thread creation, the other sort of really basic facility we need in order to be able to write multi-threaded programs is a mutual exclusion facility. Um, if I'm going to write a real multi-threaded application, typically I, there are some shared variables I want to access for more than one thread, and I want to make sure that the thread that one th thread gets access to the shared variable at a time. I want to make sure that they don't step on each other. So in a particularly simple case, if what I want to do is actually just increment a, ver a shared variable within one thread, uh, I typically don't just want to execute, don't want each thread to do this. Uh, allowing two threads to do this at the same time because they could execute sort of in the, the order that I've indi indicated here. So one, basically thread one could read the value of x, let's say it gets 17, then the second thread, also trying to increment x at the same time, could read x, uh, could read the same value of x in, it, in the other thread and I'm, this is a little bit confusing, the temp variables here are intended to be, sep uh, to be local to each thread, I should have made that more explicit. So I read it into a temporary in thread 1, read it into a temporary in thread 2, increment the temporary variable in thread 1 and store it back into x, do the same in thread 2, and what's happened now, I've lost one of the updates to x because I was trying to increment x in two threads, but they both had the same value, they both wrote the same value back, so as a result, it only got incremented once. Uh, 
So in order to solve this sort of problem, what I want to make sure, if I, in the simple case, if I want to increment a variable like that, I, I want to do this with mutual exclusion. I want to make sure that only one thread does this at a time. And we, we typically use mutexes for that sort of thing. Um, so the, the standard solution here is we limit access to the shared variables using, using mutex. I should have said mutexes here for the, using some form of lock. Uh, the C++ OX standard actually uses the term lock for something else, so I should have said mutex in this particular case. Uh, the basic idea here is that we have some, we have a mutex such that only one, which only allows one thread to hold it at a time. And uh, what this basically does, if we look back at threads in terms of interleaving, is it prevents uh, it prevents certain kinds of interleaving. Basic, so if I have the, the example from the previous slide here where I'm incrementing x uh, in both threads, I acquire a lock before doing that. I acquire mutex, I should say, before doing this. I release the mutex at the end of this in both threads. Uh, what a mutex enforces is that a particular thread can only acquire the mutex when, all, when no other thread is holding it. So when every other thread has, has released, has released any, muta any well, has released the mutex that it held, has released that mutex if it held it before. Uh, so in this particular case, since the second lock can only complete, can only appear in the interleaving here, uh, after the, the, the other thread has done its unlock, this basically means that uh, there are only two possible interleavings here in which this particular program can execute, in which thread one and thread two can execute in parallel. So if thread one executes m.lock, then it has to keep running until it executes m.unlock before thread two can execute m.lock. And vice versa, if m.lock, if uh, this goes first, uh, then we end up with this interleaving here where the, the second thread completes first and then the first thread executes. <coughs> so that ensures that I don't lose any updates. That ensures that when one thread loads x, it'll also be the one to write back the value of x. And then the other thread gets its turn. So C++ OX mutexes, again, sort of the abbreviated synopsis looks like this. Um, I, can, um, I can create a mutex. Uh, there is no, um, I cannot copy a mutex. A mutex is, uh, uh, I, th let me see, is it, actually I don't even remember. Is a mutex movable? It's certainly not copyable. It's movable, I think, so that's, uh, uh, that was abbreviated here. Uh, I, can, uh, I can lock the mutex, I can unlock the mutex. Uh, so what lock does, as I said before, it basically waits until all other threads that have, or any other thread that held this mutex has released it. What try lock does is it tries to acquire the mutex. If another thread holds it, it just fails and it just says I couldn't do it rather than waiting. Uh, there's one condition here which is that for reasons related to the memory model which uh, I won't have time to go into in, in detail here, uh, this actually, you should treat TriLock as though it can fail even if, the, lo even if the, uh, the lock is not held by any other thread. Yeah? I'm just wondering what kind of condition under what kind of condition would that be detectable? Because after all, even if uh, fails, you know, then the, the other threads may have stopped holding, holding it by the time you get a chance to look again or anything. Uh, yeah, I mean, basically what it prevents is uh, if you don't have this condition, uh, you end up in a situation where tie lock makes it possible to invert the sense of a lock. So Trilock makes it possible to um, essentially do some work, then acquire a lock, and have another thread essentially ask, if this lock is held, uh, 
then the uh, then I can go ahead. So then I know that the other thread, the first thread, has gone far enough. I see. It so gives it gives you the uh, opportunity to abuse the thing. So. It gives you the opportunity to abuse it, and this basically this rule, even though the implementations probably won't actually cause this to fail, it fails spuriously. Uh, by assuming that it can, you're forcing yourself to follow the right rules, which will make the memory model work out correctly. Uh, there are various other ver versions of mutexes in the, the C++ OX standard. So there's a recursive mutex class, which is very similar to the plain mutex class, except that you can acquire it more than once in a given thread. Still, only one thread can hold it at a time, but, in, but a particular thread can hold it multiple times. There's also a time mutex class, which I think has marginal utility, but this is nonetheless there uh, if you need it. Uh, so if we want to implement a if we want to implement a counter with the C++ OX mutex, uh, the one way to write this, probably not the best way to write it, is oops, uh, is sort of the obvious way. In order to increment x, we have some mutex m that's associated with x that protects x. Uh, we lock the mutex before incrementing x, we increment x, and then we unlock the mutex. That's easy enough. The only problem here is that if I had some more complicated piece of code in the middle here that could actually throw an exception, this would be bad because uh, there's nothing to release the mutex on the exception path. So I end up with a thread that holds the mutex indefinitely, which usually means that nothing, no other thread will uh, make progress and the whole system deadlocks. Uh, so in order to make it easier to avoid this problem, uh, there's another facility in the, in the C++ OX standard, which is basically just a guard uh, that automatically acquires a mutex in its constructor and uh, releases the mutex in its destructor. And it has some additional facilities here. It, uh, I can actually use one of these things in a case in which I already hold the lock previously. So I can use the facility to automatically remove the to automatically release the mutex in the destructor, even if I originally held the lock. Uh, there's actually a fancier version of this called unique lock in the standard as well that has many other additional capabilities and that keeps track of whether the lock is currently whether the mutex is currently held or not. But I won't say more about that. Um, so the better way to write something like a simple counter increment with a mutex is this way. So we still need the mutex that protects the lock, but rather than explicitly locking and unlocking the mutex, I protect it with a lock guard, which acquires the mutex on the way in here, and the destructor of the lock guard releases the mutex. Yeah? Why is it that the constructor of the mutex doesn't do that? Why does the mutex need to be outside the... Uh -huh. Uh, mutex needs to, needs to exist. What, need, the, the mutex, right. It has to be shared, otherwise it's not. Okay. Um, so I think this is basically still relatively straightforward. This one, I'm just going to tell you about that condition variables exist. Condition variables are basically used to wait for a condition. So for example, if you have a thread that waits for a buffer to be non-empty so it can process something in the buffer, it will, you typically use a condition variable to wait on it. I'm not going to say much about condition variables because they're fairly independent of the rest of this and I'm not going to have time to, for a detailed discussion here. But if you know what they are, they're there. Uh, there's again a generalization a uh, condition variable any that deals with arbitrary mutex types rather than just the, the built-in one uh, that uh, is otherwise behaves similarly. So let me now get back to the memory model issue which is really sort of what I want, mostly want to talk about in this talk. Um, so, so far as we said at the beginning we've assumed that the threads are executed as though the individual steps of the threads were just interleaved. So basically we have what's called a sequentially consistent execution. 
Uh, on the other hand, I'll argue that this is actually not the model that we want for two reasons. Generally, people point out that uh, this isn't actually this is difficult to implement, potentially expensive to implement, and that's true, and that's usually the motivation for moving away from this. But I think it also doesn't it doesn't lead to the right programming model generally. So I think there are also programmer motivated reasons for moving away from this. Uh, so to illustrate those issues, let's look at sort of what's I think become the standard example in this area, and this is sort of this is uh, what's known as Decker's mutual exclusion algorithm stripped down to its essential core. So it's hard to recognize this as a mutual exclusion algorithm, but trust me, you can turn it into one if you add some extra code to it. But uh, so the the basic idea here is that we have two different threads. Uh, each one of which assigns, initially assigns one to a global variable which is initially zero and then reads the other variable. Uh, so the question, the interesting question here is, is it possible that both of these threads will read back a value of zero? You're assuming that they're pre-initialized to zero? Uh, I'm assuming that X and Y are pre-initialized to zero. Uh, yeah, and I, that will be a pervasive assumption throughout my examples generally, that everything is initialized to zero. Um, so the question here is, uh, can both of these read zero? In the interleaving-based view, the answer is no, because, the, because if we just try to interleave the steps of these threads, basically one of these assignments has to go first. And then if x equals 1 goes first, the thread 2 will go, uh, will, uh, thread 2's instru instru instructions or statements will appear after that. And clearly R2 equals x will have to read a value of 1 for x, because at that point x has been assigned. Uh, on the other hand, in real implementations, if you try this just with ordinary variables, uh, even in assembly language, what you'll find is that this outcome is unlikely but quite possible. And it's possible for a couple, at least a couple of different reasons. One of them is that compilers really like to perform loads early because it gives the hardware more time for the load to complete before I actually, before I actually need the result. Uh, so if there were some use of R1 be below this, which there, in a real case there probably would be, uh, it's likely that my compiler might actually move this load from Y into R1 up above X equals 1 at which point clearly I can get zero in both cases. Um, the sort of other issue which is closely related is that hardware, actually I should point out on the compiler side, the reason of course this is quite possible is because when the compiler is optimizing this, as far as the compiler is concerned, these look like completely independent statements, right? They don't touch the same memory. So by normal compiler optimization rules, which are based on single-threaded behavior, it's entirely acceptable to reorder such statements which are independent. Um, the hardware actually does sometimes to do something similar. Usually it relies fairly heavily on the fact that it doesn't have to wait for a store to X to actually complete before it can go on with further instructions. It generally just writes X to, to a store buffer and sort of waits for it to, well, it doesn't wait. It lets it drain out slowly to, to the cache and then to memory. Uh, but in the meantime, it goes ahead and does the load. So in fact, even at the hardware level, at the assembly code level, this one may finish first before the store actually becomes visible to memory or the cache or becomes visible to other threads. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the implementation efficiency motivation for doing this. It turns out there are other reasons why, from a programmer's perspective, we don't really like this pure interleaving based model so much either. Uh, so far we've, sa we've said that we interleave the steps, but the question is what are the actual steps that we're interleaving? In a real implementation, what matters are the memory accesses, and what the memory accesses consist of depends on things like how big the size of an individual store and an individual load is. So if I had a hypothetical machine which could only store and load a byte at a time, and some embedded machines are probably not too far away from that. Um, and in parallel, I run two threads, one of which st stores 300, the other one stores 100 to the same variable. 
the question is, what are the possible outcomes? Well, the simple interleaving interpretation that I would like in some sense is that I get either 100 or 300. But if, in fact, by memory operations are only a byte at a time, I can get other weird outcomes just as a result of the size of the memory operations. So let's say these are 16-bit values and uh, I do them a byte at a time. I could implement this as, well, I first store the high byte for x from thread 2 here. That's the blue thread. So x i gets 0 because the high byte of 100 is 0. Uh, then I store the high byte of thread 1. Uh, which is uh, which is one since this is bigger than 256. Then let's say I store the low byte corresponding to thread one, which happens to be 44 here, and then I store the low byte finally corresponding to thread two, which is 100. So I end up with a high byte of 100 and a low byte of 100 decimal, which actually works out to a final value of x of th for x of 356. Yeah. Well, at a, at a language level, it seems to me if you're going to say there's sequential consistency, you would have to s divide things up at sequence points and not at memory access points. So this... Yeah, I mean, that becomes... It sounds like it's, it's basically... In some sense... The hardware doesn't do it that way again. Uh, in some sense, that's true. I'm dividing it up at sequence points would be very expensive because that, right? Uh, I mean, if you if you could somehow divide it up at at sequence points, uh, yeah. I mean, sequence points are sort of a funny notion. It's hard to see how to define that, but you could possibly. Uh, I agree. I mean, there are other sort of completely unrealistic possibilities here that uh, that might be easier to use, but yeah. So if you make this X atomic, would that mean that it would be a line property or does it mean uh, that there would be barriers to prevent this kind of torn right? Um, if you, uh, we haven't really gotten, okay, so the question is if I made X atomic, uh, what would happen? Would it be aligned properly or would there be barriers or fences between, uh, between them? I think barriers or fences actually don't help in this particular case. So the, uh, basically at that point, we'll talk about atomics later, but uh, at that point it's the, uh, the implementation's responsibility to either align things correctly so that this doesn't happen and, and perform the accesses at sufficiently large granularity or to use a lock under the covers to, in order to be able to implement that. So, but we'll get back to atomics. Okay. Um, so the other sort of fundamental problem with sequential consistency, which I think is more at the core of this, is that if you're reasoning in terms of sequential consistency, you actually, in order to convince yourself that the program is correct, you actually have to talk about interleaving at the level of steps, whatever they might be. Uh, in fact, that's very hard to analyze. It's very hard to get your, to wrap your head around that in practice. So generally what we want to do is we want to, in practice, really reason about interleaving at much larger uh, at a much larger level of granularity. So we want to talk about interleaving of atomic code regions, uh, which, uh, which, which are much bigger in size. And we'll see that we can actually do that with a little bit of programming discipline, which also gets us out of the efficiency is issues here. So the real programming model in C++ OX, and this is actually very similar to, to most other programming languages, so at least we've been trying fairly hard to get this consistently adopted across, uh, basically across uh, all the, Im the important mainstream languages at least. Um, so the, the way this really works is that we need a couple of definitions here. We say that two memory accesses conflict uh, if basically they access the same, if they can essentially interfere with each other. What it means for them to interfere is that they have to access the same scalar object. And for C and C++, scalar object here also includes as a special case contiguous sequence of bit fields. So we treat a sequence of bit fields next to each other as a, a single scalar object. So they have to touch they have to touch the same object or sequence of bit fields. Uh, at least one of the accesses is store, uh, 
if we have two loads, uh, if we have two accesses, both of which read the variable, those don't interfere with each other. We can reorder those with no problem. Uh, so for example, if uh, we have an assignment to x and another, and another statement that reads x, those conflict because one of them is a store, this one is a store to x, uh, and they both touch the same variable. We then say that two memory accesses participate in a data race if first of all they conflict, so they touch the same variable essentially, and they can occur simultaneously. Uh, this is a bit informal, if you look at the standard there's a more careful definition here, but basically if they can appear as, uh, that what that basically means is that they can appear as adjacent operations in this interleaving uh, which are performed by different threads. So that essentially means they should, they're, log they're logically capable of being executed at the same time. Uh, if we have, if our program execution allows such a, uh, such a data race, then in the case of C++ OX, actually we give it completely, un we only give it undefined behavior. We say nothing about how it behaves. If the program is data race free, then we're back to the original sequentially consistent semantics. So then we're back to the interleaving based semantics. So this has the advantage now that uh, we, this has the advantage now, and I, I should probably go on to the, the next slide here, uh, that in reasoning about programs, we still only need to reason about interleaving based semantics. We never need to think about anything else. But we need, to re we need to think about the interleaving based semantics twice. We first need to, need to uh, question ourselves whether there is a way to get an interleaving based semantics that occurs two of, that ends up in a data race with two of these conflicting accesses appearing next to each other in the interleaving. If there is a data race, then all bets are off. On the other hand, if there is no data race, then again we need to ask what can possibly happen in such a sequentially consistent interleaving based execution and that's how the program actually behaves. Uh, so the question is given that we disallow data races, how do we actually prevent them? Well we already saw one way to prevent them and that's by using locks, mutual exclusion, mutexes. Uh, if we uh, if we have two threads incrementing x and we enclose the increment, we protect the increment in a, with a mutex, then those two accesses to x can't occur simultaneously, so there's no longer a data race. If we have two threads incrementing x without a mutex independently, then those acts, one of those stores can occur at the same time as the load by the other thread and we do have a data race. So at that point, we actually have undefined behavior in the real, in the real world. If we increment, increment x without protection like that, uh, we have undefined behavior and we have, no, we have no useful semantics. We have essentially have an error. Uh, so locks give me one way to, put, to avoid data races. Uh, there's another facility which are atomic variables which give me another way to avoid data races. So if I want to increment x in two threads independently without interfering with each other, I can make x atomic and use an atomic increment operation and that will also work correctly. That will also prevent the data race and it will prevent the lost increment as well. Um, now I should say in C++ OX there are actually for performance reasons ways to explicitly relax this sort of sequential consistency guarantee even if there are no data races. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. You should use that with, uh, with caution. That was a controversial decision basically which was made to allow uh, more efficient support of existing architectures, existing machines. Um, so if we go back to the sort of canonical example here, the, the Decker's example, uh, so again I set a global variable and then read it in the other thread. Uh, if I just write this with normal variables, uh, this has undefined behavior because certainly this, this load from Y can occur at the same time as the store to Y. 
and I can easily generate an interleaving in which these two are next to each other or those two are next to each other. In either case, I have an execution with a data race and I'm actually not guaranteed anything about what happens here. So the, in fact, the outcome in which both of these read zero is entirely, is entirely justified. So if I were to actually use this as part of a mutual exclusion algorithm, I rely on the fact uh, that at most, at most one of these reads zero and that one can go ahead and enter the critical section. In this case, well, if I tried to do this, both of them could go and enter, enter the critical section. Uh, in fact, it can also read 42. Uh, right. Exactly. As far as the, the actual specification is concerned, these can also read 42. And you'll, you'll, see, some, uh, you'll see a worse example a few slides down here, actually. Um, so this has a data race and undefined behavior. On the other hand, I can make X and Y atomic, in which case basically it becomes the implementation's responsibility to make sure this works correctly. And if X and Y are defined to be atomic, then this outcome in which both of them read zero is no longer allowed. And this actually has to work. I actually can, can use this to implement mutual exclusion. So, oh, actually, this was already the next slide. So, uh, why are data races bad? So, let me, uh, let me just make this point that if you have a data race in your program, uh, you are actually allowed to get really weird behavior. It doesn't necessarily have to behave like you just read a funny value or an unexpected value. So, just reading zero or even reading 42 in the last example, as was pointed out, isn't, isn't the worst that can happen. So, here's an example program in which I have, a, uh, I have a simple unsigned variable x and uh, let's just think about this one particular thread initially. Uh, so I check as if x is less than 3. If x is less than 3 then I do something depending on which of the three possible values it is. And let's assume my compiler when it's compiling this now knows that I uh, it sort of uses standard sequential reasoning, which it turns out actually by the no data races assumption it's allowed to do. Uh, it notices that I've checked that x is in bounds here, that x is less than 3. Let's assume it compiles the switch here as a branch table. So it does it by, in it, by indirectly jumping through some array essentially to some address, depending on whether x is 0, 1, or 2. Normally when it compiles a switch statement like that, it, may, it inserts a check to make sure that x is less than 3 to make sure that I don't branch to some, I don't load an out of bounds entry from my array and branch to nowhere. On the other hand, in this case, I already did that check. So the compiler is perfectly allowed to just say, okay, I know that x is in bounds, so therefore it's going to be 0, 1, or 2. So I can just go ahead and use that as an index to this branch table and branch to the appropriate address that's in this array and I'll branch to, to something in the, to one of these three. On the other hand, now consider what happens if in fact there was a data race and another thread at the same time in here in the middle modified x. What will happen is that x might get set to 4 so x is no longer within bounds, so in fact the code that the compiler generates will look at the, uh, the fourth entry of the array here uh, and use that as an address to branch to, which means effectively that I end up branching to nowhere as a result of this data race. So this is in fact extremely unlikely behavior with real implementations, but the point here is that if you write programs with data races, uh, you should basically shouldn't count on any behavior, any particular behavior, because anything as of up to and including a wild branch actually may happen. Even if the compiler didn't optimize it and left the x minus x less than three inside the switch, it would still fail, possibly. I, well, it might still, oops, uh, it might still fail because it, uh, because it might have a window an between the check and the jump. Right, I mean, so your logic might still fail, but you would, but the, at that point the compiler would insert the check and you would at least branch to some place, you would at least do something that's consistent with the semantics of the switch thing. You wouldn't. After well, the, the check. After the check. Uh, right. Well, I mean, it, yeah, okay, I'm assuming that after the check you have it in a register, but you're right. If the compiler, in, in fact, 
if the, this is the compiler and sort of check and it reloads the variable after that, so then, you, that then you have the same exactly the same problem. You're right. Uh, let me make a couple of observations about this particular definition of data race, which tend to, uh, tend to cause confusion based on past experiences. Uh, so in fact, I should say this memory model, in fact, fundamentally isn't any different from what POSIX has defined for the last 15 years, probably. The, the only difficulty we had is that uh, the POSIX standard in some cases is unclear, and it was sort of unclear as to exactly what constitutes a data race and so on. But this is really just an interpretation of what we had before. It's not anything fundamentally new. On the other hand, with this particular example, when I asked the POSIX committee about whether this had a data race, I got what I thought was the wrong answer, sort of I think about half the time. So, uh, so the important thing to observe about data races is that we define data races in terms of sequentially consistent, these interleaving based executions. So something has a data race only if in one of these sequentially consistent, one of these simple executions, uh, these conflicting accesses by different threads occur next to each other. So if we look at this particular example here, where again everything is initially zero, and that's important here, uh, whether this has a data, does this have a data race? Well, syntactically it kind of looks like it because I'm assigning to, I'm assigning to Y here and why is being tested there. On the other hand, by our definition, it doesn't. The easy way to see that is that since X and Y are initially zero, there is no interleaving based execution in which either Y equals one or X equals one ever get executed. So there's no execution which even contains a store to any of these variables. Since there are no stores, there can't be any conflicting executions that execute, uh, uh, conflicting executions uh, executing simultaneously. So this definitely does not have a data race. And I think this is important if you try to go down sort of the other syntactic route here, things don't work. You end up in, in really messy, te messy territory, territory. You don't want to go there. But on a particular processor, could actually be a data race if, if the processor predicts that x might be 1 and takes this uh, So there, really yeah, good. so there are certain kinds of uh, things that processes are now not allowed to do, including speculative stores. And we'll say, uh, actually, this model does impose some restrictions on compilers, which we can argue about whether they were there or not. Before, on the other hand, there are restrictions that are currently not satisfied by some compilers, and I'll talk about that if I have time here. Um, the other observation about data race definitions is that we defined data races in terms of accesses to scalar variables, to things like integers and pointers and so on. On the other hand, in general, a good way to, in a good way to define a library interface is to make sure that whenever I don't have any high-level races, so for example, and for a container library, whenever I don't have races on containers, so when I, whenever I don't have the situation where one thread is writing to a container while another thread is reading it, then I also don't have any races at the memory location at the scalar variable level. So that allows programmers to reason about data races at the, the higher container level rather than having to worry about the scalar accesses within the library. Uh, that has some consequences about how you design libraries and how you design client code that uses those libraries. Uh, so in particular, it means that access is to any hidden shared state maintained by the library. And typically, this is sort of, th these are things like uh, allocators within, that are used within the library that maintain shared state that are used by different containers, essentially because all container storage is allocated from this, uh, this allocator or caches that are maintained by some, some library function to allow you to quickly uh, get the same answer again if you keep calling the same function on the same argument. Those are also potentially shared between threads. If those are shared between threads, it's the library's responsibility to make sure that it, they don't introduce data races. Um, on the other hand, if there are sort of high-level data races between container accesses to the same container, then it's the user's responsibility to acquire a lock to make to avoid those races. 
the, this is generally the sort of threat safety criterion that's used by the C++ OX standard library. Uh, it's also the one that's been used by implementations for quite a while, pretty much. Some containers relax this, so for example, accessing distinct vector elements is, is okay at the same time. Uh, it's depending on the particular container, but in general, a library should at least ensure that if you don't have any accesses at this level, then you don't have any races at the low level either. Yeah? Yeah, a good example of that might be like, I think it's a, what, uh, a display tree, which, you know, when you read the tree, it's like right. the itself. Yeah, so I mean, from it's... From the user's point of view, that I'm just doing two reads. Right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, a display tree is a good example of this because that's actually, for this reason, I think not a very good multi-threaded data structure because every read turns into a write access. So. Um, so, yeah, and I think this is generally the correct library threat safety condition. It's a little... The history here is a little confusing as with many of these things because usually when people talk about threat safety they mean a stronger property and when they mean when they talk about threat unsafe it's not clear whether they whether it still satisfies this rule or it's just completely threat unsafe. So you have to be careful about the terminology here. Um, so what's so a core advantage of this model here um, is actually, I said earlier that we wanted to get away from reasoning about interleaving at the individual and selection level. We instead wanted to reason about interleaving at, bigger at the bigger block level. Uh, so, in fact, the consequence of this restriction to data race free code is that so long as we satisfy this, synchronization free sections of code, so any section of code that doesn't contain synchronization operations, and by synchronization operations I mean things like lock on, like mutex operations or atomic operations. Uh, any of these synchronization free code sections appear to execute atomically. There's no way they can be visibly interleaved with something from another thread. Uh, and the way that happens basically is uh, we can convince ourselves if, they, they, if you could notice that some an operation from another thread were visibly interleaved, say here between the assignment to A and the assignment to B, so if, an, if some other thread could test that it's in the middle here, that A has changed value but B hasn't yet changed value, that other thread would have to introduce a data race. So essentially we're saying that uh, so long as you, I'm not allowing you data races, you have no way of ever being able to detect what uh, one of these intermediate states between synchronization points. And that also means the compiler is allowed to do all sorts of f funny things reorder here within those, in those regions. Yeah? So you highlighted that, that thing in blue there. Um, synchronization three code sections appear to execute atomically. I presume that's because it's important to the programmer somehow. I, but I don't exactly see how I can take advantage of that. Uh, well, I mean, it means that, uh, so the, uh, good point. Uh, so I highlighted the, uh, the comment that synchronization free code sections appear to execute atomically. Uh, so the question is, in what way is that important to the programmer? So one of the things it means, for example, is that if I have a, a simple library routine that contains no synchronization inside the library call, I don't ever need to worry about sort of what intermediate state changes the library goes through. I'm guaranteed that correct code will only be able to observe the final state. So I never need to worry about, about documenting intermediate transitions in library interfaces. If you're I never did before, so... You're yeah, I, I think people tend to assume this implicitly. Uh, people tend not to reason about things, interleaving things at the, uh, uh, at the step level. Okay. So I'm just saying, in some sense, what I, I think I'm telling most people here is that what, you've, what you were doing all along is correct with this version. It'll work. Yeah. yeah. So long as your code is data race free. Right. Uh, so the, the basic implementation model underlying all of this is that uh, we can reorder operations within these synchronization free regions fairly liberally and the compiler can do this, the compiler can do that as well. Uh, on, on the other hand, 
Uh, synchronization operations in this model need fairly careful treatment by the implementation. So the compiler has to either understand synchronization operations or it has to treat them as completely opaque as operations that may potentially modify any memory location. And that's what existing compilers generally already do. If you call, if you call pthread mutex lock or whatever some existing synchronization operation is, generally the compiler doesn't understand it, it just assumes any global variable may change as a result of that call. Um, in addition, and actually as far as the overhead is concerned, this tends to be more serious. The synchronization operations like the mutex lock operations need to include instructions to prevent hardware reordering around the synchronization operations themselves. And these are typically on most architectures called memory fences. There are special memory fence instructions which are unfortunately very expensive. Uh, you should think of sort of dozens to hundreds of cycles in the best case, as opposed to a sort of loader store instruction, which is on the order of uh, the cycle or so on a modern implementation, in the best case. Um, so let me, now that we have the memory models, let me say something about detached threads again. I told you earlier already I don't like them. So uh, let me explain more why I don't like them. Uh, so let's say here that we have some main thread that's executing. Uh, at some point it creates another thread which is a detached thread that's just allowed to run by itself until program termination. Um, this detached thread as well as the main thread access some library which has a particular library shared variable in it which gets constructed at the beginning here when it's first accessed and which sort of dies here uh, this, is a, this is a static variable, so its destructor gets called when static destructors are called by the, the main thread here, so at some point it goes away. Now the problem is I've created this thread here and then detached it by calling the detach operation. Uh, the detached thread basically runs until program termination and there's nothing to prevent it because it doesn't know that static destructors are being invoked. So there's nothing to prevent the detached thread from continuing to access this library shared variable and it may access that shared variable even after it's been destroyed. So, yeah? So would it be safe to say that a detached thread is probably only safe <coughs> in the case where you don't use any shared variables? Uh, right. The problem with that is that uh, most threads tend to use things like the standard library, which may use shared variables under the cover, at least it's, we don't promise that it doesn't. Like C out or something. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so for dealing with this, uh, so one way to do this is to implement your own protocol to actually wait for them to terminate, to terminate them before static destructors get invoked. Uh, this is somewhat, the fact that there's no thread cancellation as I mentioned earlier sort of also generally gets in the way with a lot of this. But if you're going to wait for, um, if you're going to wait for this thread to terminate, there's a question of why you would bother to detach it anyway. It makes a lot more sense just to keep it joinable and then join it. Yeah? Um, so that, that thing about the standard library not working, that, doesn't that extend to memory allocation and deallocation too? Uh, it does, I believe. So, uh, so uh, continuing here, there, are, there is in fact a facility in the, uh, the standard library that allows you to deal with this sort of, uh, but I think it's sufficiently mixed bag that probably mostly you don't want to, which is that you can exit the process without calling static destructors, and that's called quick exit. Yeah? Is quick exit new in C++ 11, or is it, has it always been? Uh, it's new. It was introduced basically to deal with this issue. Um, uh, the other alternative, and as I said, this is sort of my personal favorite here, is just don't use detach even though it's there. But what happens if someone throws a detached, a cloud exception to the detached thread? Does it still terminate everything or is it just detached? Um, if, you, if you throw in an exception in a detached thread, uh, let me see if. In, I think an uncaught exception in any thread will just terminate the process, yeah. Okay, atomic objects, 
so I, this is actually the one place in this presentation where I'm going to say a little bit about other languages because it's really confusing. Uh, so I, we've been talking a little bit about atomic variables. It turns out basically all modern languages have some facility along these lines, but it's confusingly named differently. So you, in an attempt to help you to try to keep this apart, I've tried to, uh, I've tried to summarize it here. So in C++ OX, we have these sort of generally C++ preferred uh, atomics here which are uh, which basically are template atomic which can be parameterized with respect to any type essentially and give you an atomically accessible version of that type there's all there are also some sp some special types like atomic int and so on uh, which allow you to access C types, uh, certain C types atomically. This was originally meant for C compatibility. At this point, I think it's there both, it's there probably mostly for, to ease the transition to make it easier for people to provide some atomic support without actually providing the full template here. Um, so C1X initially was only going to have these, but it in fact now has another way of declaring atomics, which is sort of roughly analogous to the atomics template in, in, C++, in C++ 11 or C++ OX. I don't understand. What's the distinction here between OX and 1X? Uh, this is C. Oh, C. C, C. Okay. not C++. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, so these actually have very similar but somewhat different facilities. And C, this is a built-in uh, built type qualifier in the language, among other things. Uh, C++ volatiles are not atomics. In particular, volatile does not ensure that an access takes place indivisibly. Because you can declare a structure vol a struct volatile in which case it will probably uh, be visibly updated in multiple pieces. And uh, there are other issues as well, but that's, uh, uh, that's the main one. In Java, unfortunately, the equivalent of atomics are volatiles, uh, to make things confusing. And there are these additional atomics in java.util.concurrent.atomic that also behave this way. So, but, but these are basically the analog of atomics in C++ OX. Uh, in C sharp, there isn't really an analog to the simple atomics that I'll talk about, but the volatile is sort of is the closest, but it doesn't behave the way I would like it to behave. Um, these, the, except, well, the, the ones that actually do behave as synchronization variables here guarantee indivisibility of operations. Uh, they are treated in the memory model by essentially not counting them when determining the uh, when you determine the existence of a data race. Uh, so a program that has simultaneous accesses to the same atomic shared variable is fine. That doesn't include a data race. And since it doesn't have a data race, it still has to behave sequentially consistently by default. Uh, though, again, there are some ways to escape from this, which if I have time, I'll talk about briefly. Uh, if I use this sort of atomic, uh, then again, something like Decker's algorithm will just work. It, it's the implementation's responsibility to make sure it works. On the first line, the atomic template, can it take any type or only an integral type? Uh, it can take any type. It, there, actually, that's I, I should be a, uh, no. I should be. There are some restrictions, but it can take it take a type of any size at least. I don't remember off the top of my head exactly what the restriction is, but certainly, I mean, plain old data types would generally work. And it'll, it'll generate a lock when necessary. It'll generate a lock when necessary, right? So yeah. So volatile is still part of C plus plus, right? So yes, vo volatile is still part of C++, but it's meant to, to, for things like accessing device registers. It never helped it, before. It, it, it never officially helped before with threads, though in fact in the absence of atomics, it's sometimes the best sort of partial workaround you can come up with. So, uh, so here's a quick summary of the, uh, the, the atomic template. Again, this is partial. Uh, significantly simplified, a lot of ugliness removed, and so on. Uh, so basically this gives me operations uh, for constructing an atomic from, an, uh, from the, the element type, uh, to store to the atomic, load from the atomic, uh, assign to it, uh, which is actually very similar to the store operation. 
uh, converted to the uh, the element or base type to the uh, the element or base type here, uh, and that's essentially a load operation. So this allows you to write code using atomics using a con using conventional syntax. You don't have to s you don't have to say store and load everywhere. Things will generally work correctly. Uh, there's an atomic exchange operation. Uh, there are atomic compare exchange operations. And there's a way to ask, because sometimes it actually does matter, whether these atomics are implemented with a lock or without it. If they're implemented without a lock, they're safe for asynchronous signal handlers and things like that. So what was the last word on whether is lock free is a, like that's not a static function. Yeah, that should be context for um, it's, uh, that's actually a, a tricky question. It probably should not be const expert. The, the issue here is that whether or not something, something is lock free often is something that you, on many platforms is something that you don't know at compile time. Mm -hmm. uh, because the, uh, because the variants of the architecture that, uh, that may implement compare exchange and hardware or not, depending on which particular processor model you're, at, you're on. So this has to give you a consistent answer for all elements of this type T. On the other hand, it's, uh, it may be dynamically evaluated. In particular, it's something that you can't really evaluate, it, evaluate until after you started running and you know what hardware platform you're actually on. And what about um, unaligned? Uh, the, uh, so the atomic template uh, is intended to ensure that these, uh, th that these things are aligned correctly. On the hardware platforms where you normally get sufficient alignment in any case, the implementation is encouraged uh, to use the same representation as for the ordinary for the base data type so that in fact casts will work and things like that. But we can't require that because that might not be the case. Uh, so, I'm sorry. Go, go back to, yeah, increment. Okay, okay. So it's, it's some specializations here have additional operations as you would expect. So atomic of integral allows you to atomically increment. So if if I have an atomic of int x and I write x plus plus, that's an atomic increment. This is different from Java, for example. Um, Atomic to atomic assignment, we should point out, is intentionally not supported in C++. It turns out it was inconvenient to do the same in, in C1x, so actually in C it is supported, which is sort of a potential portability gotcha if you're writing uh, files that need to compile both ways. Uh, okay, so let's talk a little bit about the performance consequences of all of this. Uh, so the the data race free restriction and the sequentially consistent guarantee for data race free programs uh, imposes some optimization restrictions, both on the compiler and the hardware essentially. Uh, the, many of those in some sense have probably been there all along, it's just that the rules were so ambiguous that the compiler implementers manage, some compiler implementers managed to ignore them so far, they can't anymore, we hope. Uh, <laughs> um, there is another kind of sort of performance issue here, which is what I'm mostly going to talk about. Uh, sequentially consistent on atomic operations basically have to ensure that these operations uh, appear to be executed just in a, a in simply interleaf fashion. Uh, in order to be able to do that, we have to. Uh, ensure that the atomic operations themselves have to be executed in this interleaf fashion, which means they can't be visibly reordered. If I have, in, in the Decker's example, if I have an atom with atomics, if I have an atomic store followed by an atomic load, uh, I need to make sure that the hardware doesn't do the load first before the store. Uh, it turns out that ensuring that generally requires at least a fence on the store, which is a bit unfortunate. Uh, so on x86, in fact, the uh, sort of non-optimization overhead of implementing sequentially consistent atomics consists entirely of adding a fence to every atomic store. So that's unpleasant and we're th sort of sometimes trying to convince hardware architects to do something about this. I think there are things that can be done about it, but currently we're stuck with that. Um, 
We also have to ensure that ordinary memory operations aren't visibly reordered with respect to atomic operations. That's actually something that it turns out is, a, is free on x86 but requires fences on some other architectures. So we have some issues here with requiring fence instructions which are typically expensive and I'll say more about that. But let me say a little first about the compiler restrictions, the kinds of things that compilers are no longer allowed to do. Um, so if I have a structure with two small fields, say two small character fields, some old compilers, if I assign to one of the structure fields for various reasons, they might load the whole structure into a temporary, update the, uh, the field in that temporary, and then store the whole structure back to X. That's no longer allowed because if there's a concurrent update to to the the other field to B field at the same time to the B field at the same time, say the the update occurs in the middle here is performed by another thread. What happens because I load the whole I load the whole structure and then write it back? I lose the concurrent update to the B field that happened in the middle here. Uh, so that's that's not acceptable. Uh, it was done in the past on, on alphas, which didn't support byte stores, but with those are long dead, on old alphas actually only. Um, it turns out compilers still commonly do this, not in this case, but in cases involving bit fields. Uh, so basically compilers have to be fixed to deal with those cases, uh, those cases correctly. Currently we still have this problem if A is a bit field and then we have a small non-bit field next to it. In those cases, again, simultaneous updates to A and B don't cause a data race. They're separate memory locations as far as the race definition is concerned. So they shouldn't interfere with each other and the compiler has to preserve that. How, how can a compiler do that other than by adding a lock? Uh, well, we rely on the fact that for all modern architectures, or essentially all modern architectures that we care about support byte stores, so this is no longer an issue. Uh, you can also do this with... You could have a, I'm sorry, you could have some, you could still have a bit field of three bits and a bit field of four bits, and don't you expect yeah, that one? Oh, okay, so the question was about uh, having a bit field of three bits and a bit field of four bits next to each other. In that case, remember, contiguous sequences of bit fields for precisely this reason count as a single memory location. So I'm not allowed to, I'm not allowed to update those concurrently without introducing a data race. So when I'm updating one bit field, I'm allowed to overwrite an adjacent bit field. I'm not allowed to overwrite an adjacent non-bit field. I see. Okay. So, uh, so I work with one of these ancient processor types that do embedded work. Um, so the, uh, what are they going to do? Uh, there are two. <laughs> Uh, there are several possible answers. So long as it's ancient enough that it's not a multi-core processor, there are software workarounds. Um, if it's a if it's a multi-core processor, you have a problem. You can still do it with uh, with compare exchange, with a compare exchange based implementation, but it'll be a performance issue. Okay. I, guess I, I was looking at that. And I, I, one approach would be to add more padding, but I would. Since I'm dealing in embedded code, I would hate to say, well, I'm now using C++ OX, my padding explodes. That's another solution, that. but yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the best way to do this actually is to implement this in terms of restart, in a, on a unit processor with restartable critical sections. You can get atomicity f f fairly cheaply. You have to do some work, but. Okay. Okay, the other, um, the other restriction that we've imposed, which was arguably there all the time, but the people didn't pay attention to before, is that uh, in a case like this, where I have a global variable count, if this is a local, it doesn't, that's, whose address isn't taken, it doesn't matter. But if it's a global potentially, uh, potentially shared variable, I have a simple loop that traverses a linked list and counts the number of positive elements. I, I increment each increment count each time through the loop. There are some compilers, notably I think GCC still does this, that will transform this to code that first loads count into a register and then updates register in the loop and then stores it back. Uh, this is no longer acceptable because it potentially introduces data races. 
In this particular case, it's unlikely that it will do so, but there are other cases in which the probability is actually significantly higher, which is similar. Uh, the problem here is that in the case in which there are no positive elements in the uh, no positive elements in this linked list, the original code never touched count. So if this is part of some bigger function which happens to count the number of positive elements and I invoke the function in one thread on a linked list that I know has no positive elements, I can update count concurrently in another thread without introducing a data race. I'm sorry, With, count, count's on the stack, right? It counts, no, count is global. Oh, global, global. Global? Okay, <laughs> well, whatever. Uh, it's uh, well. I was really worried about this example. Oh, file scope uh, static. Yeah, saw that word, so yeah. Uh, it's. I mean, it also happens with locals whose address is taken or something like that. But in the simple local case, this isn't an issue. Um, so in uh, so in in this particular case, this transformation is no longer legal because it may introduce a data race, even though in this particular case it's unlikely that it would do so. But that's something to keep in mind. Uh, so in addition to that, we have some interesting hardware restrictions uh, that we touched on earlier. You basically want, for multiprocessors at least, you want fast byte stores. Uh, the other more subtle restriction that I won't have time to talk about is that since atomics have to be sequentially consistent, I have to be able, I have to, be able to force things to be sequentially consistent somehow. Um, for example, I, most people assume that I can do that by introducing fences. That actually turned out to be a really tricky question as to whether that's actually possible on real architectures. So we actually spent years discussing whether or not it was possible to implement sequential consistency on x86 and PowerPC. Uh, so x86 went through several revisions of its memory model, I think largely as a result of this, but now it's clearly possible. Uh, PowerPC, it's possible at significant cost. So when they go through uh, the revision of memory model, does it mean that the chips change or just the... the well, I mean, that, that's of course an issue with all of this. With x86, the general belief is that all chips, existing chips actually, at least recent ones, satisfy the, the new version of the memory model. Uh, in general, manufacturers tend to be very defensive in, as to what they document in the memory model. Because if they, the stronger the memory model is that they document, the more likely it is that they will have a bug at some point in the future, right? So, uh, so as far as the overall performance costs are concerned, uh, compiler restrictions typically sort of based on experiments that we perform, uh, performed in the general experiences, those, uh, those optimization costs are relatively minor. They're sort of on the order of uh, certainly single digit percents, probably more like, more like under one or two percent. Um, fence costs for sequentially consistent atomics, which we currently have none in the current, current code base, but those are potentially a bigger issue. Um, as a result of that, uh, C++ OX, as I mentioned before, actually also allows non-sequentially consistent atomics, which are non-sequentially consistent even if there are no data races. Uh, this, I should emphasize, is definitely a double-edged sword. Uh, these can be significantly faster, especially on non-x86 architectures. On x86 architectures, you can wave your hand and say that it probably isn't, a, isn't that big a deal. Uh, on the other hand, they're faster, but they're really hard to use correctly. And what actually bothers me more about them is that if you use these non-sequentially consistent atomics, it's often hard to hide the non-sequential consistency inside the library. It often ends up showing through at the interface level, which means your user potentially has to worry about it as well. Um, so this was a feature that was initially controversial. If I want to make a controversial statement here, then I, my hope is that these will actually be decremented after, de de deprecated after a few iterations. And uh, the hardware sort of catches up to be able to implement the sequentially consistent atomics more efficiently. But this is going to generate lots, if I say that out loud here, so Michael Wong, was, if he's here, is about to object, I suspect, and there are other people. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. Explain the, uh, the, the second last statement a little more. I, I, we don't get how to hide library uses. 
And the problem is that if I use one of these non-sequentially consistent atomic operations inside a library, in many cases, not only is that particular use inside the library not sequentially consistent, the actual calls to the functions that are implemented that way will all, may also appear to not be sequentially consistent. So the, these things are sort of tend not to be purely implementation details. In a few cases, in a few cases, I can get away with uh, with hiding them, but I don't know how to do that in general. So. So, so why inter even introduce these in C plus plus OS? Uh, so the question was, why do you even introduce these? The, the problem is, and on at least some architectures, these fences are so expensive at the moment that there's a lot of common code you can't really write with reasonable performance uh, without introducing these. Like so, architectures? Can you name uh, yeah, I mean, PowerPC is one of them. Uh, ARM may or may not be one of them as well. Uh, so, so if I understand right, that means if you, if you want to write uh, Current code with reasonable performance on PowerPC and ARM with C++ standard, you probably will have to resort to... You probably will have to resort to these in a few places. I mean, if I were using these, my advice would be to first start with sequentially consistent atomics, and if you have a performance problem, then resort to these. Oh, so we are supplying sequentially consistent ones also. We are supplying sequentially consistent ones as the default. The other ones are intentionally intentionally have long names. Uh, <laughs> and if, we're, if we're using if we're using the higher level interfaces of uh, mutexes and such, we're likely to get reasonable performance. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, those are fine. Okay. Um, Okay, so I'm also running out of time here. Let me really quickly give you a flavor of the kind of uh, operations that we have here. So this at least uh, answers the question about sort of ease of use. They're very conspicuous. But the uh, probably the most common alternative here to sequentially consistent atomics are these mem uh, memory order release and memory order acquire operations. And the basic model here is that if I store something with memory order release semantics, with memory order release ordering, and I then read that same value with memory order acquire semantics, I'm guaranteed that I can see everything that, uh, that was done before this memory order release store. So this, this is best explained quickly in an example here. So if I say assign uh, 42 to data, and then I store something in a flag saying I'm done storing the data. So I store it with memory order release. I then in another thread notice that uh, this flag has been set. Oops, there's a typo there, sorry. Um, so I, I check the flag with memory order acquire. I've now, I've now seen this, store, this memory order release store with this acquire load. At that point, I'm guaranteed that I can also see the store to the data variable that was stored before. So this sort of release and acquire basically transfers memory visibility from one thread to another thread. So, so essentially, uh, if, I'm, if I want to write something with a simple done flag that says I'm now done I'm now at this point, you can go ahead and, and see what I did, then release and acquire are sufficient. Um, if on the other hand, uh, I try to do this, I try to write Decker's algorithm from before, yeah? Um, I know that the author of Boost Atomics, which is an implementation of C++ OX Atomics, um, his documentation suggests that you should always specify memory ordering and that you should always use the store and load explicitly. Um, even on x86. <coughs> um, um, I don't know. I mean, my personal, yeah, I mean, my advice would be in cases where you, you're relying on, where sequential consistency is fine, I wouldn't bother specifying it because, in fact, one of the motivations here was to, to specify this in such a way so that you can determine fairly easily whether you, somebody is using explicitly uh, explicit non-sequentially consistent memory orders by doing essentially a grab for memory order. Uh, 
Uh, so I would not recommend that you do this for the sequential consistency case. Uh, but if you do end up fine-tuning the memory ordering, then certainly you need, uh, you have to use explicit stores and loads because the, uh, uh, the conversion, uh, the, uh, the implicit conversion and the assignment, in fact, have no way of specifying this. Uh, so if I try to write Deckers this way, uh, that won't work. Because, in fact, uh, I can still have the case in which both of these, uh, both of the loads here see a value of zero, in which case actually no load ever, no acquire load ever sees the value of a store release. So that ordering constraint that I specified, in fact, means nothing for this example. It's really only, Deckers really only works because of the sequentially consistent guarantee, which guarantees me that these actually behave in interleaved fashion. So this is, a, this is incorrect code if I, expect this, if I expect to preclude that. Uh, there's also a memory order relaxed facility which sort of drops the acquire release visibility rules. So that, that's even weaker. Uh, note that all of these actually do preserve uh, sort of the interleaving based semantics if I look at only a single variable. So operations on a single variable still behave as though they were interleaved. But that's not enough to make Decker's work and it's not even enough to make the example with setting data earlier, a couple of slides back work. Um, memory order consume is essentially, sim essentially the same as memory order acquire except that it enforces only data dependencies and I won't tell you much about the details of this. Uh, this again has, an, this has impact on PowerPC and ARM. This might be much faster than memory order acquire. Uh, on uh, most other architectures I expect implementations to ignore this in that th these things will trans be translated to memory order acquire. Uh, yes, sort of, oops, I'm a little over time here, sorry. Uh, uh, so, um, here are some attempts at safe usage guarantees. So, memory order relaxed can actually be perfectly safely used in a few contexts. Uh, so, in particular, if no concurrent access to the atomic is possible, sometimes you have a variable which sometimes needs to be safely accessed concurrently by multiple threads, but you know that certain accesses, in fact, will never race with anything else. In that case, relaxed is fine. Um, if you're update, concurrently updating a shared variable in multiple threads, but you never look at its value, except after proper synchronization. So if it only stores that race, essentially, or increments or something like that, where you don't look at the value of the increment, uh, then I think it's also perfectly fine to use memory order relaxed. And I think a general rule of thumb, I'm not really positive about this, certainly there's no theorem to this effect, is that memory order release, memory order acquire are generally safe when it's okay to ignore the update for a while. So basically, if you're in a situation where the, your code doesn't break if, the, the store, if you don't see the store release until much later, it might run less efficiently or something, but the code won't break in that case, then you're probably okay to use these. Um, so here's a, I think this is pretty much my last slide here. Um, so here's an attempt to uh, basically take double check locking idiom. This is b implementing essentially lazy initialization. So I want to check quickly uh, whether, some, whether some particular variable x has been initialized uh, and if it's not initialized, I want to initialize it. So it, a, a way to do that is initially to check, uh, has this variable been initialized, has, is x init set, where I now make x init atomic. Uh, if x init has been, uh, has been set, I'm okay, the variable has been initialized, and I can go ahead and use the variable. If it hasn't been initialized, then I acquire a lock that's guarding its initialization. I check it again while I'm holding the lock to make sure that nobody else has come in in the meantime and initialized it. Uh, I do the right thing here. I, uh, in this case, I think it's okay, I believe it's okay to use a, mem a release store here because if I see, don't see this until later, uh, 
uh, that's okay, what will happen is I'll just have another thread that ends up taking the slow path here through the lock, through the critical section. I'm sorry, I thought release, the release store was the sort of more conservative of, of the options. What would be? Uh, sequentially consistent is more conservative. The default is more conservative than release. Okay, I, I assumed that we were in the non-sequentially consistent world here. So in the non-sequentially consistent world here, release is the most conservative thing you can do. Right? Uh, release is the most conservative thing you can do for a store. On the other hand, it's often still not sufficient, right? I mean, sometimes you may still have to do sequentially consistent. If we were writing Decker's algorithm with explicit memory ordering, we would need sequentially consistent. And can you explain why relaxed is okay for the load there? Uh, relaxed is okay for the load here because it doesn't actually race with anything. It turns out I only store to the flag uh, while I'm holding the lock, and I'm holding the lock. So the lock is already protecting it. So relaxed is fine. Okay, so, so here's the, the so really quick summary. So basically, C++ OX provides the APIs at, at three levels. The, the simple level that most people are used to is threads, locks, condition variables. Sort of everything works the way you expect. Uh, we add in atomic operations, which will hopefully prevent people from writing programs with data races as they actually do with POSIX threads, uh, in, even though they're not supposed to. So this allows improved performance. Occasionally it actually simplifies the code, I believe, uh, for things like counters. Uh, this isn't necessarily m more difficult than that. It depends on the application. If you're going to do, do general lock-free programming, it, it clearly gets much harder. Uh, and the third level throws in these low-level atomics. And at that point, really, you need to be careful. Uh, about what you're doing. My experience is that people rarely get this explicit memory ordering stuff right. Even those people who, sh who, are, who implement system libraries and really should. So, yeah? For the, for the double check locking case that you were just showing, um, it seems to me that once you hold the lock, it would be nice to be able to do all those things to the atomic variable as though it were an ordinary variable and not pay for any of the additional synchronization. Am I missing something? Uh, so the, the question is, once you're holding the lock, uh, can you sort of access the atomic variable as though it were an ordinary variable and not pay for the synchronization? So the, um, the answer is you have, to be, you have to be careful here in the store case because the store case actually runs concurrently with this load. Because this load doesn't hold the lock, right? That's what the complication is. But uh, the relax is the same. The relax is almost the same. It gives you some additional properties. It, uh, on most architectures, it actually generates an ordinary, lo on, on, an ordinary load. Uh, on, on Itanium, it turns out it doesn't because uh, Itanium doesn't give you cache coherence for these things without uh, some special work. Yeah. So given that in a usual program, this pattern will do a new in that initialize x one time for a global variable, wouldn't it just make more sense to write this using the, the default option? Because it's going to be plenty fast enough. Because you're not going to... Um, okay, the answer there, the question is, is this plenty fast enough with sequentially consistent atomics? Uh, the answer there is unfortunately architecture dependent. Okay. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, so on x86, I completely agree with this because the only overhead on x86 is associated, uh, is associated, or if this were sequentially consistent, the only overhead would be associated with the store. But uh, after the first time, you're, you're after the first time, you don't execute it, right? Execute any of this below the Exactly. So the, that's, that's negligible. Uh, the problem is, it turns out on PowerPC, uh, in fact, this load, if it's sequentially consistent, is much slower than if it's a choir. So that's the one that actually makes the difference. So the, the, the real lesson probably ought to be that, that the way to do this portably and efficiently is to use the once construct that's higher level? Uh, that's probably true, yeah. <laughs> uh, the question is whether you should really be using the once construct, which is also provided by the, the library in order to do this uh, in a portable and efficient way. Uh, and the answer, the answer to that question is yes. On the other hand, this makes a good example. So. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you.